All right, so as a lot of you all know, we uh, have our pastor, we have our um, kids, we have counselors who have gone to camp uh, for the week. So we are definitely praying for good decisions to come out of that. We never know how God wants to, to use people, um, no matter how old or young. So we're just praying that the, the preaching is hot. We're praying that the, the kids get something out of it. And we have some first-time counselors as well. And we're just praying that God would work on their hearts as well. You never know how, how God will use you. Um, also, just make sure to keep in Steve Bright in prayers at this time uh, for his recovery. Um, just, just, just pray that the Lord will stay close to him. Uh, right now, and we know that the pulpit here has been uh, on fire lately with our pastor and how passionate he preaches. We had Pastor McDonald who came here a couple weeks ago, actually on a Wednesday, preached about hell. We also had Pastor Star who preached our whole anniversary Sunday. And of course, we had Dr. Cloud who came through and he taught on uh, the bird's eye view of the Bible and did the whole New Testament or Old Testament. And likely, Pastor wanted somebody to continue to, to bring that fire. However, everybody's out of town, and so you're dealing with me tonight. So uh, bear with me uh, on that. Um, I have a simple message tonight. Um, I recently celebrated a, a birthday uh, this month, and so I have a title of my message is called Number Our Days. Number Our Days. And if we can turn in your Bibles to Psalm. Chapter 90, we're going to look starting at verse 12, to Psalm 90, verse 12, and it says, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long, and let it repent thee concerning thy servants. Oh, satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us, and the years wherein we have seen evil. Let thy work appear unto thy servants, and thy glory unto their children. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish thou the work of our hands upon us, yea, the work of our hands established thou it. Now, I'm going to tell you about the importance of wisdom. Now, God's word tells us about how important wisdom and being wise is. In fact, those two words are mentioned 503 times throughout the Old and New Testament. Make it an essential to the Christian life. And it's easy to obtain. We don't have to wonder how we get it. Solomon asked from, for it from the Lord and in Proverbs chapter 2 verse 6 turn there for me real quick Proverbs chapter 2 verse 6 it says for the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding in James 1 5 you don't have to turn there but it says simply if any of you if any of you lack wisdom let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. So we don't have to go far to figure out where we get wisdom. We just need to go get it from God. Now, what's the value of wisdom? Turn over to Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16, and we're going to go to verse 16. Proverbs 16, 16 says, how much better is it to get wisdom than gold and to get understanding rather than chosen? Oh, sorry. How much better is it to get wisdom than gold and to get understanding rather to be chosen than silver? Now, we know that gold is a hot commodity. We know that it's highly sought out throughout this world. We know treasure hunters still dive into uh, for shipwrecks underwater to try to find those old golden valuable coins or people search for in caves hoping to strike it rich a uh, man uh, a millionaire over a decade ago hid some treasure in the mountains and then asked people to look for it and people did people lost their lives trying to find treasure that an old man 
just hid out in some cave. So people want to try to find this gold. But the Bible says that wisdom is better than gold. It's better than gold. Now, we know that there's status symbol around gold. We know that some countries' currencies are based off of, of gold prices. And then we know that some people are still trying to mine for it nowadays. Gold is powerful and people obsess over it. But this verse tells us that wisdom is better. And we see that God is affirming in his word for us to look past our fleshly mindsets about an object and more to what he wants for us. So tonight we will learn about numbering our days and how to apply our hearts to wisdom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful, Lord, for this time that we can come to you. And Lord, I just pray that you would, uh, God, calm my nerves, Lord. I, I pray that you would just use this, this simple message, Lord. Plant seeds, God, and it's the only way that, that uh, uh, can happen, God. I pray that you would keep the hearts. I do pray as well, Lord, that someone would come away with, with something out of this, Lord, some, some nugget of wisdom, Lord, that, that you put there. And pray, Lord, that you would get all the glory for it. We do pray for those people that are uh, going to camp at this time. Pray for Steve McBride as he continues to recover, God. Just, just be with his spirit at this time, God. So we're thankful for everything you do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, point number one. We can live a life of wisdom by making the most out of our time. Now, other than salvation, one of our most precious commodities that we have is time. We recognize, we must recognize how short our time is. Well, we're either one breath away from eternity or the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And because of this, we have to make sure that we're making the use of the time that God has given us. Nothing is ever promised, of course, but you must ask yourself, how are you spending the time that you have these days? Are you using your time wisely day in and day out? Matthew Henry commentary says that we must live under a constant apprehension of the shortness and apprehension uh, and uncertainty of life and the near approach of death and eternity. We must so number our days as to compare our worth with them and mind it accordingly with a dose of diligence as those that have no time to trifle. No time to trifle. We have to live each day not for ourselves, not for our flesh, but as if we have no time to trifle because we don't know when our last breath's going to be. We don't know that, that, that time. And so I have just a, a, a bit of a, a testimony for you. Uh, I'm 38 now, uh, so it goes with this perfect symmetry here of, of these eight. So at the age of eight, eight years old, I thought about what life would be like when I got older. Candy and soda whenever I want. Late bedtime while watching TV. I was numbering my days, but nothing productive. At age 18, I graduated from high school on my way to undergrad in a little town in the mountains of Banner Elk, North Carolina. I have to say it with my country accent because it's a small place. But anywho, um, I numbered my days for when I would graduate from school and then move on to whatever the next step was. When I first started my journey, God was not a part of the picture as I had not I would not profess Christ for another year when I met my wife, Tamara. Um, at age 28, found myself wisely married to that beautiful woman named Tamara for almost two years by this point. And I was thinking a little bit more about being older, but still didn't really have a purpose. We started to try to find a church, but living for God was really not in the picture at that time. And definitely wasn't displaying much wisdom in the area of finances or getting into my Bible. I was counting down the days for what I would earn my master's degree at that time. That time period was full of working days, and then at night I had classes, and then even later at night I was doing an internship on the streets of uh, Boys Town, actually. So I would wake up and I would be like, oh, what do I need to be? I need to be somewhere. But I wasn't productive with my time. I wasn't really counting down the days, those things that I should be doing for God. I wasn't at that picture yet. Now I find myself at 38 years old looking back some, but realizing more and more that every breath that I take is closer to my last than my first. And I wonder how much more time do I have left to teach my children about the love of Christ? How many more opportunities will I have to tell my loved ones about the need for salvation? 
But more than that, I think about how I can live my life better for my Lord and Savior. How can God use me more for his glory? This is my desire. and This should be the desire of everyone who calls on the name of Christ. How can God use us? So you see, we number our days when we think about something important that's coming up, like an activity or birthday or some other celebration. Whenever a vacation is coming up, I'm telling you, we, my wife and I, we like to cruise. We love it. Uh, the pandemic shut all of that down. So we like to, to, as things open up, think about we're cruising again. But we shouldn't be more excited for that than what we should be doing for God. So we should we make sure that even though we're excited and counting down our days for vacation, but that we're also counting down those days for what we should be doing for our, for our Lord and Savior. And when we number our days, we have to make sure that we're, we're doing a good purpose. I, I mentioned in my short testimony that even though I was numbering my days when I was eight and 18 and, and 28, I really didn't have a purpose. I really didn't have a purpose that, that had God in it. So I was just walking around, basically, just walking through life without God being right there with me, without me serving him. And so, again, as I get older, I think about what more can I do to make sure that God is not only involved, but is the chief of what I'm doing. And we know that we don't have many days on this earth, so the worldly sense says that we need to seize the day, right? Live life to the fullest. But some people believe that living this, those full days is better without God being there. People would rather serve the flesh. People would rather just live their life. And we shouldn't be, as Christians, we should not be in that same mindset. Yes, we should be living our life to the fullest, but not for ourselves, not for our flesh. We don't have to, to, to fight for our flesh to, um, to do something bad. We have to fight our flesh all the time to make sure that we're not dabbling into those things that are, that are evil, that are sins according to uh, what the Bible says. And then we have to make sure as well that we're applying his guide map, the Bible, to what we're doing on a daily basis. When we apply what he says to our life, we are now applying that wisdom that was talked about in that, that first verse that we read, that we need to apply our hearts to wisdom. That's when we oftentimes uh, miss if we're letting our, our flesh reign supreme. So making sure that we are living according to God and, and what he wants us to do. Now, praying, planning prayerfully, or uh, this point, haste makes waste. So turn your Bibles to Proverbs 21, verse 5. Proverbs 21. Proverbs 21, verse 5. And it says here, the thoughts of the diligent tend only to plenteousness, but of everyone that is hasty only to want. Now, believers should prayerfully make long-term plans. Uh, you should have a vision of what you want your spiritual life to be. Uh, of course, praying for your career, your family, and whatever educational goals you have. So it's okay to do things for one, five-year, and ten-year plans. We don't want to uh, just be going through life willy-nilly, just hoping that God's going to bless whatever we're doing. We need to make sure that we're praying for it and then making sure that we're planning for it, right? So even though that our plans can be very limited on, on circumstance and knowledge, we should still be making sure that, that we're planning. And of course, trusting in God's ultimate plan and his sovereignty over all of our lives. But again, having that, that vision for your ministry, for your life, is important as, as God states. So this verse here talks about diligent, tend only to plenteousness, but everyone that is hasty only to want. Now, haste makes waste. As I mentioned earlier, this phrase is credited to my late father-in-law, Mark Randolph, uh, who used to teach Tamara and her brother, Jimmy, about slowing down, about not rushing through things, and making mistakes that could have been avoided just by taking a, a few extra moments uh, to think through things. And then about being purposeful with your actions. Not just, again, doing things willy-nilly. 
Now, at the time, when Tamara used to say that to me, it only seemed like she was trying to be sarcastic to me uh, for whenever something happened. If I dropped something, haste makes waste, haste makes waste. And you know, it got on my nerves for a while. But then I stopped to think about it, about those decisions that I've made, actions that I've completed, projects that I've worked on, uh, food being cooked, you know, recipes that, that I've messed up, you know, these, these plans that just kind of came together and we just did stuff. And I think about how much haste did make waste. I think about wasting those resources, wasting the time having to redo something that I had messed up on, or even worse, when you leave the mess around and then you just keep being reminded of it every time you see it. The biggest example that I can remember is when we went to go buy a car after I had kind of uh, uh, gotten us into an accident. Sorry, Tam. And um, her father had given her that car. Uh, it's a pretty sore subject for her still. But, um, you know, God forgives. Amen. And so did she. But we went to uh, check out a car at a used uh, lot. And if I remember right, the car that we went to go look at had either been sold or was in the process of being sold. So we couldn't go look at the car we wanted. And, of course, the salesman wants to just get you into anything. We go around the lot over and over. He's showing us car after car. And we come across this red Suzuki Forenza. Suzuki Forenza. Now, we looked at the car. She fell in love with it. Um, it had some red flags with it. Air didn't work. The trunk didn't open. There was no radio in there. But they assured us these are things that they could fix for us, right, for very low or, or no cost at all. And then they gave us a price tag. And we had, of course, planning prayerfully. We had the money to, to purchase. Um, the car was, I think, $3,700. And before we purchased the car, I remember us doing a, a token prayer like, Lord, bless this car if it's something that you don't want us to have to just shut it down. But we didn't really allow for God's leading uh, for this. And we actually ended up buying this, this vehicle. And I can tell you that that car broke down within a year of us buying it. And we put more, well more than the $3,700 that we purchased for it. We had brakes go out. We had stress. We had uh, a gasket go out on us. We had lots of things going on with that vehicle. And I think about it, if we had just sought God's wisdom, if we said, you know what, if God really wants us to have this, it'll be here a different day, and then come back. But at the time, we thought we really, really, really wanted this vehicle, and we did need it, but we didn't look for God's wisdom, and we definitely did not apply it into this situation. So us going to God and, and really trying to get a hold of him about that decision would have prevented probably that situation. And so I tell you, even if you think you need it, even if you know you need it, go to God about it. And don't just token go to him about it. Take some time and pray about, God, is this what you want me to have? Is this the vehicle? Is this the decision that you want me to make? Is this the job that you want me to have? Really, really pray and think on, on, on what you're doing before you make that decision. It might be a good decision for you, but God always has a better one. He always has a better one. Staying away from evil. Staying away from evil. This is a, uh, another way that we can apply our hearts to wisdom. Applying our hearts to wisdom. Now, God wants us separated. And he wants us to, to, and that separation can be forced when family, friends, and, and coworkers that you, you come across um, are doing things that you know uh, they shouldn't be doing. Um, but God does tell us that we should go out. He tells us that we should go out. Uh, Proverbs 11.30, you can turn there. Proverbs 11.30. God wants us to go out and knock on doors, and he tells us about how wise it is to do so. In Proverbs 11.30, it says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. So obviously going out and, and winning souls is wise, and that means that you may come across when you knock on those doors, it may be in a place that you normally wouldn't be in. But God told us that we needed to go seek the lost and, and give the gospel. Now, people may be engaged in things that 
we are firmly against, but we all need Jesus. We all do. We're going out for the purpose of, of winning them for the Lord. However, there's still times that we sacrifice some of those, those convictions when it comes to those we love and respect. We, we say, oh, when we go out sometimes, like, oh, I don't want to be around this and that because it's, it's terrible. But then we get around our family, right, and we start sacrificing those things that we were convicted about in some of the areas that we may go into. But say, ah, it's okay if my family does some of this stuff. But we shouldn't be that way. We shouldn't be putting ourselves in situations that we're compromising our testimony. Some family gathering where you know that relative's going to be, and you know which relative I'm talking about. The one who can't hold his or her tongue because they have to tell it like it is. They don't care about the words that are coming out of, of their mouth. They don't care who's around, even kids, or that work function where you know there will be drinking. You say, well, I really won't be engaged in anything, so that's, what's the big deal? The big deal is the, the compromise that you're doing to be there, to put yourself in a, in a position where you're around evil. And, of course, the Bible tells us to avoid the appearance of evil. So you have to realize and, and, and reconcile God's ideas not your own, not say, well, it's just okay because I'm just here for a few minutes. That few minutes could traumatize your child that you're, you're bringing into that situation. It could hurt your testimony by someone saying, oh, oh, you're here? I thought you, I thought you were the church girl. You're the church man. Oh, I, okay, I didn't know you get down like that. So we, we have to be careful about making sure that we're not around evil as, as, uh, as we know we shouldn't be. And of course, you have to reject those things, reject those people, which could cause you temporary pain and guilt. But as a follower of Christ, is it better to go to some function where you know people will be drinking, smoking, using filthy language, etc.? Do you want your kids in that type of environment? Now, a few weeks ago, I taught a lesson on the Christian home. And as a parent, you work so hard, should be anyway, you work so hard to keep things away from your house, away from your kids. You work so hard to, to keep the filth out of your house, but then why waffle and then bring them back into worldly things and situations where you know it runs contrary to, to what you say you stand with God. You know your kids see it. You know your kids will ask you about it. You know it'll, it'll stick in their brain just for a little while while they try to process what's going on. And even if you don't have kids. Like I said, your testimony is important. People are looking at you all the time. You okay, Patrice? Patrice, you okay? Okay. All right. Stay awake. So again, you shouldn't waffle. You should be awake to make sure that you're, you're not bringing your kids, not putting yourself in positions where people see and then question where you actually stand with, with the God. Or wonder, why do they want the same thing that you say that you have when you're engaged in the same thing? You're hanging around the same people that they hang around. What's the purpose of that for them? How, did it, how are you showing them the need for a savior? The answer is you're not. You're not. So we need to make sure that instead of taking our kids or being around that function, around that filth, that we are trusting in our wisdom that we get from the Lord. Turn to Ephesians 5.15. Ephesians 5.15. This verse says, So then, that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil, wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. So this verse here talks about redeeming the time. And this, this t redeeming the time is really talking about making sure that you are being wise with your time, making sure that you're getting that wisdom from the Lord, and making sure that you realize that you shouldn't look so far into the future because every day that you come across, there's going to be some evil. So you can't always just look ahead because you could run into something and trip over something that you're, you're not looking for. So we have to make sure 
that we are redeeming the time that we're given, of course, because we don't know how long we have. And it, the rest of that verse says, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And so we see that this wisdom of applying our hearts to this wisdom means that we need to understand what the will of the Lord is. And how do we do that? Well, we've mentioned some things before. You pray about what God's will for your life is going to be. And that means that you don't make that decision until you, you get that understanding for what God wants for you. Of course, there's some things that are, of course, good for your life. There's things that, um, um, that God can use you for, but he can use you for better things if you would just wait. So we can't be in a rush to try to get what we want or what we think God wants for us, but we need to, to, to really get a hold of what his will for our life is. And so growing in that wisdom requires us to value it above all earthly successes of life, whether that's a good job, whether that is um, uh, just financial blessings, all of that, I mean, that's okay, but we need to make sure that we shift our perspective, shift our mind to the things above and not the things that are here. We get sidetracked so easily. We want the best things of life. Nobody wants to... to uh, have broken down things. Nobody wants to, to struggle for things. But guess what? There are lots of people that struggled in the Bible. Read person after person struggling. Even when they were doing God's will, things were still a struggle for them because life's hard. So we have to make sure that we are putting our success, uh, putting our emphasis on God's wisdom rather than the achievements of the world. And for Christians to practically apply Proverbs 90.12, that we read, we have to realize that our time on this earth is short. We either die or Jesus returns. It's one or the other, really. And then our time is limited. We have to number our days and live the lives that we're supposed to through God's word. Not, not through what we feel is right, but through his word. He has all the wisdom we can ever want. We just need to ask him for it. And of course, before making any decision, we should make sure that we plan prayerfully. Go to God to see what he has for you. And if you don't, then you won't really know the direction you need to go. And trust me, it will be worth it not to hear, haste makes waste. Too many times we make decisions on our gut feeling or what our heart says or on a whim, and that never turns out well. And then finally, Show that God given wisdom by making sure that you're fellowshipping with the right people. And I'm not saying that you need to abandon your, your family and your friends. What I'm saying is you know who may be in your life that is detrimental to your walk with God. That should be number one. That you have to hope that they will be halfway okay to be around. That shouldn't be your, your goal for the people that's in your life. That uh, I guess, uh, they're okay to be around. No. You nor your kids nor any of the people that you really love should be around people like that. And God wants us to, to teach us to number our days. But will you listen to what he has to say? He's talking. He's convicting. He's pricking. But are you paying attention? Are you sitting around waiting? Are you hearing what he's saying? Or are you just going off to do what you feel like you want to do? So make sure that we are numbering our days, but not according to what's next for us, but what God has for us. And we should be praying about that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful, Lord, 